The eyes of the nation are on Minneapolis this week with the death that sparked a worldwide movement once again taking center stage. The trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd was set to begin today with jury selection, but that was cut a bit short. The judge overseeing the case paused the trial as prosecutors moved to add additional charges. Chauvin is all already being charged with second degree murder and manslaughter. Prosecutors want to reinstate a third degree murder charge, which is easier to prove. The trial is already being described as one of the most significant in recent U.S. history, but it comes as the country grows more divided over what exactly happened in the eight minutes and 46 seconds that ultimately caused Floyd's death. New survey found the percentage of Americans who characterize his death as a murder has fallen double digits from 60 percent to 36. And after last summer's racial reckoning led, black, led by Black Lives Matter, the outcome of this trial will be the clearest sign of how much the country has really changed, or if it hasn't. <laughs> Joining me now is Midwin Charles, attorney at Midwin Charles, an associate and contributor at Essence Magazine, and Jamel Hill, contributing writer at The Atlantic and host of Jamel Hill is Unbothered on Spotify. Midwin, let me start with you. The prosecution wants to reinstate a third degree murder charge uh, in addition to the other charges. He's already charged with second degree murder and manslaughter. What is third degree murder in the state of Minnesota? What, what would this added charge mean? Well, uh, Sorlina, you're right. Um, this third degree murder charge would really change the game from the perspective of the prosecutor, because what it would do is it would just make it easier to secure a conviction. Um, the third degree murder charge basically essentially means that Derek Chauvin acted in a way that was depraved, right? So, so the way in was, and he caused George Floyd's death as a result of his actions that were of a depraved mind. And when you compare that with second degree murder or second degree manslaughter, it's just a completely different threshold to prove. And I think the prosecution did a very good job in trying to appeal this particular decision to to make sure that the trial doesn't start today, because whether or not that third degree charge is reinstated completely changes how the prosecution approaches jury selection and also how they approach putting together their their case right because if now you're trying to secure a conviction on three completely different charges which each have different elements of the crime and all with the same mm -hmm. standard of proof of course beyond a reasonable doubt but if they each have different elements of of, of the crime what you want to do is make sure that you're looking for a jury that's going to listen to all the evidence and it completely will dictate how you put together your witnesses how you you put together your documents and all other kinds of evidence that you have. So in terms of the the elements, is the intent in third degree murder different than in second degree? Can you unpack that for, for us? Because it's, I it's, think that's sort of where the, the nuance is there. Yeah, the second degree is, is just a higher threshold because with the second degree charge, the prosecutors basically have to prove that Derek Chauvin intended to commit a felony. So he killed George Floyd during the process of committing a felony. In this case, the felony would be the assault, right? Taking the knee, putting it on his mm -hmm. neck, applying pressure for eight minutes and 45. So they have to prove beyond the reasonable doubt that that action led to George Floyd's death, but they have to prove that actual assault. Right. With respect to second degree yeah. manslaughter, yeah. what they have to what they have to prove is negligence. What is the reasonable standard? What would someone else have done in that same instance? So there's a negligence aspect aspect to this. So that's a little bit less. Right. Then you go down to third degree murder, which is also less. Now you have to show that he was acting in a depraved sense of, of a depraved mind. So those are completely different things that you have to show. And if you are putting together your case, it's going to dictate how you put the evidence together. That's helpful. I hope you guys enjoyed mini law school because that was several months <laughs> of law school, just understanding what she just said. Um, Jamel, Derek Chauvin was a 19-year-old veteran at the Minneapolis Police Department, and he had 18 prior complaints. So it's not like this was uh, a, an officer who has never been in trouble in terms of uh, excessive force complaints. Can you speak to the larger issue um, of how you know police officers 
in, in many of these instances, when they do look into their histories, uh, when, when the trial comes up, they have 18 complaints or 25 complaints. There are many complaints. And, and really, it's more about how police officers are policing communities of color, by and large. It's a bigger issue than just Derek Chauvin himself. As we have seen I don't many think, instances. I, of, oh, I can hear oh, you now. You, I couldn't hear you at first. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Keep going. Um, Keep going. No, what I was saying <laughs> is that, um, and this is why this trial is so meaningful, because the element of accountability has been missing in how the American police operate. And what we have seen is that you have officers in all, uh, many of these cases from Eric Garner, like you just list anyone you want to, um, that there is, this is not their first time, that there's usually some history of them using their authority and a power in an abusive way with a community of color. And what happens is those complaints are either swept under the rug, dismissed, or they're able to minimize any real accountability or punishment because of the power of the police unions. So it's not just Derek Chauvin that's on trial, it's this entire system. And already you mm -hmm. can tell that there's just this sense of worry and fear, especially in the black community, because too many times we have seen this trial, trials like these turn out where the police face no accountability, which only further sends the message that as long as you brutalize and beat, murder and kill us, there will never be any accountability for the police. I mean, I think that that's the, that's the anxiety that you um, described that, that I'm feeling in this moment, even just as a person, not even as someone who is in the media, but having lived through Rodney King, Eric Garner, uh, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, so many trials mm -hmm. where, um, you know, the, there was no justice. There was no justice. And in Eric Garner, I think that was one of the more recent and egregious cases, because it, like this case, that was also on video. And if you can't get in trouble for choking someone on camera until they die, then I don't know, you know, police officer or not, that should just not be uh, something that we should tolerate in a civil society, Midwin. What is the chance, though, in this case that we may see something different? Um, it's very, very rare for police officers to even stand trial in cases like these, even when there's video, which is hard is hard to say. But that's the, those are the facts. What's the likelihood I, I of going, conviction here? Yeah, I, I was going to say that we we actually need to stop and recognize how rare it is that we're actually even getting a trial, because in many of these cases, you'll have prosecutors uh, come back and tell us that the grand jury decided that there should be no charges. We just had that happen with a case in, in Rochester, New York. We had it happen in the Tamir Rice case. Right. So we never even got close to a trial, let alone a conviction. Um, but uh I think that it's rare to get a conviction out of this case, but I think it's important to point out just a little bit of a, a fact here. This is the Minneapolis Police Department where Mohammed Noor, a black police officer, was found guilty of third degree murder for killing what? A white woman. And he was sentenced to 10 years in jail and her family, her estate sued the city of Minneapolis and they got a $20 million uh, um, um, settlement amount. So it's interesting to note the instance in which you can secure a criminal conviction uh, when police unlawfully or, or kill a person who was innocent, but those circumstances don't exist here, right? We're talking about a white police officer, we're talking about a black victim. So I think it's important for us to keep an eye on just the disparity in not only getting these outcomes, but when we do get the outcomes, the fact pattern is completely different and usually around race. Wow. Midwin Charles, thank you for being here and for helping us understand all of this as we pay close attention to the Derek Chauvin trial. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.